Blessings to you this morning. Each one, very welcome. You are at the place where you belong. Thanks for what has been shared. I feel we have a very good, we've had a very good time so far already, <clears throat> and I'll continue to have one. Um, the message this morning will be concerning, somewhat concerning around the subject of Father's Day or fathering, although not so directly just fathering. <clears throat> There's a song that goes well with what is on my heart today, 908. We're not going to sing that. I just wanted to point out a few little uh, phrases. Faith of our fathers living still. And then it goes on through that song. It's always been one of my favorite songs, um, how this faith has been challenged. And um, yet through dungeons and through fire, and we could add all kinds of persecution and, and uh, many of those Hardships have not taken away that faith, faith of our fathers. Marcella and me did just a little bit of a, of a adding together of our church family, the IMF church family, and we came to this number, and I, I, you know, I'm probably still not correct, and so I invite you to, uh, to correct me. But since last Father's Day, which is a year ago, till now, there's 11 fathers that have died out of our church family. Four of them were part of our church. David Funk is almost a year ago when he died. And then it was Alvin Lowen. And then it was George Barch. And now recently Clarence Friesen. So four were sitting in our pews, we could say, a year ago. Yeah. Alvin uh, Lowen wasn't much in her pews, but all the others were present last Father's Day. Oh, well, I'm not sure Dave Funk was probably not, well, he was still around, whether he's been in church or not. So I was just thinking, that sounds like a lot of fathers. And like I said, I invite you to, uh, to uh, do the counting. I could have missed one or some. That's if you would have one sitting on each of these pews, uh, today we would fill more than than uh, one father per this this line, but that would be taking one off of all the pews minus one, and like in one row of pews here, and so that's a lot of fathers that have gone on, which means that many of us do not have a father today that had a father a year ago, and so we don't know what lies before us. My father is one of those eleven. Uh, Marcella or Roland's father is uh, another one of those. Uh, Denver lost his father. And, uh, you know, there's more. There's at least uh, more, 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 uh, yeah. And so that seems like a high number to a small church like ours. I'm not including uh, any other churches. <clears throat> Nonetheless, um, <clears throat> thinking of fathering or thinking of parenting I'm, I'm uh, challenged to, uh, to do some thinking for myself, thinking my dad passed away, and, and so uh, not that that is necessarily a huge point, as in fathering Father's Day today, but typically I would have given him a call on Father's Day, or connected in one or the other shape with him, and uh, would have had a good time. Today, the, the uh, topic I have called it this way is parenting. We could use fathering, but I thought I would want to make it a little bit more general. Uh, it's, it's as much for the, for the mothers, I take, as it would be for the fathers. So that's why I call it parenting in faith. What goes uh, in that line of thoughts, parenting in faith, is <clears throat> I would like to encourage us I hope this message is there as an encouragement and hopefully as a challenging encouragement. And that is, is your fathering or your parenting, does that require faith? Or do we just do it and uh, just move, move through life and sort of systematically raise up a family? Now, there's a few things that you probably already had very clear in your mind 
before you even had a family as to how things would be in your home. Now, you could go back in your memories and you would say, oh, these kind of things we will never have. You saw that maybe from your nieces and nephews or your sis- uh, brothers and sisters' homes or, or cousins, and you just said, oh, such a thing we will never have. Not in my home. Like, I'm just going to be the father and this will just not be in our home. And, uh, and then when they first came into your home and you realized, oh, this is exactly that which we will never have, you were kind of clueless how to deal with that. <clears throat> I don't know if you have many of those kind of memories, but I could assume that we, uh, we have that. And so, as young people, you might have some of that too. <clears throat> I stand before you today, and I would have to sort of admit that back in the days before we had children, I was blessed to be a preacher before those days, that having a Father's Day message was fairly easy in those days. <clears throat> And nowadays, I know you, will just, you won't listen to me. You will just look at what you see, and then, then it's hard for me to uh, claim how to do that. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it hasn't changed. The Bible is still here, and we, uh, we, uh, ha- we are so blessed by examples and uh, so blessed by, by verses that can give us direction. So I have as a theme verse or as my main verse today, uh, I take the text out of Psalms 144, And this is obviously uh, looking into parenting with a vision. Uh, We are heading somewhere. It's it's probably not there right now, we might say. Um, At least that's what I take out of Psalm 144. But it is supposed to go somewhere. I would like to, it's verse 12 that I have as as my text verse, but I would like to start reading in verse 11. The, the, the prayer of, the, of David here is, rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. So here's a prayer. You know, I need to get rid. I need to get free of this stuff. Now, likely David in his mind was thinking of all the wars he was fighting uh, outside of the outside of his homeland or outside of his home territory, and he was fighting the Philistines. He was fighting the evil that was around Israel. As Israelite this people back in the days, we can we can well imagine how those fathers were all in unity when David announced and said, "Okay, uh, soldiers or men, we're going to fight over at such and such an area." And the man would all get together and they would somehow hear the news and say, amen, that makes, that makes sense because there is a bad influence. The Philistines or the Ammonites or the, the Moabites or you had many of the, of the different uh, um, tribes or people around them and they would right away say, makes sense. We got to get, we got to get busy. We got to risk our lives because we have a fight, a, a battle that needs to be fought and a battle that needs to be won because this is a danger towards the future generation. And so the men would get together and they would have a fight against Whatever, whoever it was, after it was the Philistines, it was sometimes other um, tribes. And so they would, would wish to get rid of this. This was not just winning more land as in to, fight, uh, to, to farm bigger fields. Sometimes that was probably part of it. But it was to get evil out. Actually, God had called them to do that. That was God's purpose of leading them to Canaan from the days of Egypt, that they were to get rid of all the evil of Canaan. <clears throat> Have you ever thought about that? God in his almighty and his all-knowing way took the Israelites from a land of Egypt where they had been uneducated. They were very unfamiliar with God. And then God started to show his power to the Israelites through his miracles in the, in the travels of wilderness, but God chose these uneducated, <clears throat> whatever, however you, your impression is of the Israelites when they came from Egypt, God chose those families and took them out of Egypt. And you know, where was he heading with the families? To a land that was just absolutely evil. The evil needed to be rid, ridden out of, out of Canaan. 
And that's where God is taking his people to raise his people. An amazing thing. There was no such a thing as to take them out in the wilderness where nobody would challenge them. He brings them right straight centered into the wickedest areas of this world. <clears throat> Since that day, <clears throat> Israel was called to get rid of the evil around them. <clears throat> so a lot of the fighting that we read about in the in this, uh, books of Kings and Chronicles and 2 Samuel has to do with that. So these men were busy, 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 generation after generation, they were busy, and here comes that prayer, rid us or rid me and deliver me from the hand of the strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood, because, and that's the verse, verse 12, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case, Yea, happy is that people who, whose God is the Lord so far. So here was that prayer. I would like to take us into these verses, and I would wish if you just had a moment, uh, maybe you want to do this on your way home, but which of these verses does fit your lifestyle best? And I, like, I can say it's this. It's verse 13 and 14. Our garners are full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands. In other words, we are, we're, we're able to live a very high standard living that our oxen may be strong in labor. We live in a financial, a very strong economy that there be no breaking in. Yeah, we don't even lock the doors when we leave home, nor going out. We don't have to leave this country. We're here, we're safe, that there be no complaining in our streets. Now that complaining part, that's probably a personal choice, but there's no need to complain in our streets. Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Can we pray? Lord, we bow before you. This morning, it is our prayer, Father, that you would speak to our hearts. It is our prayer, Father, that you would speak especially to us as fathers or us as parents to check our own hearts, to check our own ways of parenting. God, I pray that you would impress it on my heart. You would impress it on everyone who's listening this morning on our hearts. Are we parents that parent in faith? Or do we just have a system that we follow? Do we just have a procedure that we follow? God, I ask that you would direct this message. I pray that I myself could step out of the way and that the power of your Holy Spirit would today speak to me and to the rest of us. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like to call this a holy art or a holy uh, practice of training children. When I, when I use that, I, I go back to a, a story I read years ago about an artist who had become very, very good in, uh, in his uh, drawing and uh, paintings. And so he was asked the question, what made you so, like, so outstanding in your career as an artist? And he says this, he says, it's the gift of God. I had the gift of God, he said, but I had to develop it. In other words, we could say it this way, that he as a, as a child already had that gift in him, but he had to put the efforts in developing the gift. Had he never put the pencil or the, or the uh, <clears throat> brush to work, he would never have become a good artist, but he was willing to practice and God added his blessings and therefore he became a good artist because he's, he, in this, and I, I emphasize what he said, the gift was in me, I had to develop it. When I think of parenting, I see that very much as part of, of success. 
So the, the holy art or the, uh, why I use the word holy is because when I say I am in the holy work of parenting, I'm already connecting something with God. I don't know how often you think about that. As parents, this is a holy work. It's, it's holy because I'm doing it with God. I don't want to put much of an emphasis, but I would like to say this. Anything that you and I do together with God becomes holy because I have included God in this thing, whether that is working in your garden, whether that is working in your, your, your fields or your shops. You know what? Any, anywhere where God's presence is, we could rightfully say it's, it's a holy, God's presence makes it holy. Now, we won't put too much emphasis on that. But when I think of parenting, that can make such a big difference, whether I'm just parenting by myself with the big responsibility and the big challenge of trying to raise a family and making a good home out of this, which is, which is great responsibility, but are you doing it alone as a as a believer or doing your, your, your parenting by faith, that includes God in all the steps of parenting, which makes parenting a totally different story as if I have to measure up and try to bring a family about that will be as good as all the others. Some, some parents, we are all born out and worn out by <clears throat> trying to at least, at least compete with the rest that are among us and we sit in churches and we look around us and we see, oh, that family is so good looking and that family looks so much better than ours and so we can get home and get all discouraged because we feel we're staying behind. That's not parenting in faith. Here's something that I wish to impress on every parent this morning and that is God would not give us children and not provide a way for us to raise them or to train them. Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. That is something that as parents we need to start here. Do I believe that God is giving me what it takes to be that parent? I have to confess that I have had times where I, I concluded or I surrendered or succumb to the idea that no, I don't have it. Really, that is a step of unbelief. And we need to get out of our unbelief right away because God is not pleased with a, a father or a mother that lives in unbelief. If you are a child of God, God has given you the ability to raise your family the nurture and, it, and to nurture and admoni admonish them in the Lord. So this is something that I wish to encourage each one of us. Let's take that as a, as a package of our salvation. This ability is in me. It is also in you. It might still be dormant, and I'm not suggesting that it is, but like the artist who first had to start to practice his, his gift of art, of, of art and as he started to work, he realized, I have the gift of being an artist. As parents, we need the same thing. We go to work and God adds the abilities. God adds the gift. And that is what I call parenting in faith. We don't look at our own abilities. <clears throat> Many of us probably look at ourselves and say, well, I'm far from having what I needed. And maybe we could say we blame it on the homes that we grew up in. Maybe we could blame it on the society that we grew up in because it wasn't done right where we grew up. Well, it all, could all be true, but that doesn't take it away. We have God on our side. The other uh, important part of parenting in faith is to connect our children with who they are. If you want, you can uh, turn to Psalm 127. You probably expected already that we would go there. But verse three says this way, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. It's pretty easy for me <clears throat> when I hold my grandson in these days, who is just two weeks old, three weeks maybe, but anyway, as I hold him and in his innocence and he's uh, nicely uh, bathed and he smells good, um, 
you know, that, that is, seems like a heritage of, from heaven. Yep, that's easy to, uh, easy to say. Children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is the reward. Then we come on and says, as arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are children in their youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. This has always been a very challenging psalm to me, a very good one too. But first of all, let's look at this this way. As believing or as parents that parent in faith, we see our children as something that God has given to us. Yes, it speaks of a full quiver and uh, Having, being married and having a big family is something that we realize is part of life. It is part of being blessed. But to, to uh, put these arrows, as we have in verse four, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children and the youth. To put these arrows or work on these arrows and sharpen them and straighten them, that's what we call child training. We sometimes almost lose the vision of that this is a God-given gift. <clears throat> Children are a gift from God left behind to bless us and to remind us of God's love. So as believing parents, this is, this is the mainstream that we do as parenting is we pass this love on. We pass God's love on. It's, it's a passing. We receive, we give it. We receive, we give it. As I said, many of us in this church have lost our father. And I know for sure, if you're like me, you could look back and say, well, my dad had, you know, there were days that this love didn't pass on. And we could all dwell on the mistakes of our fathers. But then we could also say, but there are experiences and we remember so well where this love was passed on. My dad had a connection with God's love. And when it came to me, that was passed on to me. And it was because of his relationship that he had with God. <clears throat> we are doing this as believing parents. How we view our children will affect every area of our children's lives, even our own. When I look at my child and I'm uh, frustrated by the lack of obedience or the lack of action as I would wish, and I allow frustration to become my set of glasses through which I see my child, I miss the point. And I will very likely cause my child to feel pain and to feel hurt and feel the lack of love. God must enlighten our eyes that we will see the value of our eternal beings in our children. Jeremiah 1 verse 5, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. This was specifically spoken to Jeremiah that, that, that he was sanctified. We can apply that too, even though we don't know exactly what was, the, uh, what was God's, God's vision for us. Uh, some of us would probably be very clear on that. Others might say, I'm not exactly sure. Um, he was ordained as a prophet unto the nations. That was the sanctification. But the one thing that we all know and that we all can accept and apply to us and to our children is, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. As your children came into this world and we accepted them and we heard their first cry, we took them into our hands the first time. Did you realize that God already had known them for the last well, we could go eternity because before they were conceived, God already knew this is the child. Sometimes, and it's a good exercise for us as parents to sometimes go back and just allow to meditate a little bit. What was it like when, you know, and then you go with one of your children and maybe you have a little bit of a hard time with, with helping your children and go back to the day when it was born completely, completely helpless, completely innocent, and you took your child into your hands and for the first time you held it. Some of us might not make much of a memory as to what went through our minds, but very, very likely we would say, yeah, we took that child and we, we, we held the child and somewhat we looked into the child's future with that 
unknown. What is this child going to experience? But at that time, if somebody had asked you, what will you do for this little, little baby? What, would you, what, will you, what are you willing to sacrifice so that this child can grow up in a happy and in a blessed home life, family life? I think I can say this conf- uh, with confidence, and that is that every one of us as fathers or even us as parents would have said, I will give everything it takes. God forbid that I as a father should stand in the way where this little one, and we have a few little babies in in church nowadays. I'm not sure how many of them we have here today, but we have a few here. But God forbid that I as an adult should stand in the way that this little baby that's completely helpless should be offended. That was easy for us to think back in the days when we held those babies. But then years go on and our children grow up and all of a sudden we are challenged. We are, our, our patience gets tested. Are we still in faith? Do we still see this as a gift from God? And that is my encouragement. Do we still accept that? Do we still think that way? <clears throat> what we can add to these babies is God had a plan for the unborn children. Even for those that are in your home today as born children, God had a plan. Parenting by faith. Point number three. The key to obedience. Love and blessings come first. You know, to be a child of God and always fearing God, dreading God, that will never make a good Christian life. What made you and me become better in our Christian life, what made you and me become more victorious in our Christian life was when we finally could accept the gift of God and we could realize what God had made us, what Christ made us. When we were fully able to accept and embrace the gift of salvation, and realizing how absolutely saved I am with Christ and how absolutely unsaved I am without Christ, when we could realize that, all of a sudden, our Christian life started to overflow. And we are still, all of us, working on trying to get more of this into our hearts, realizing that in Christ, I am so complete. Without Christ, I would be so incomplete and miserable. This is the same type of a message that we as parents need to convey to our children, especially us as dads. Can I challenge you you fathers today on a thought? Do you see your children to be benefited simply because you are their father? Take that home. Your children are greatly benefited simply because you are their father. And we need to see that in a humble way. Yeah, my child is very benefited because of me. Now, I am pretty sure that as you sit there, that many of us would say, absolutely not. <clears throat> that that's, cannot be that way. My child is, is in misery simply because of me. And part of us is probably true. That part which denies in you and me when I say your child is benefited because you are their father, that part, when you will look very carefully, you will realize that is a part of either a disconnection between you and God or simply living in unbelief between you and God. But wherever you you see yourself walking in obedience to God's direction, you can say, yes, that's right. My child is benefited because of me being the father, or you can apply that same thing as a, as a mother. So as a challenge for every one of us today, and I say this as an encouraging challenge, fathering in faith makes you and me a vessel by which our children are benefited to have us as parents. That is an extreme challenge on the one side, but on the other side, it is also a, uh, an unspeakable blessing to realize that my child is benefited because of me as a parent. The need in our families or the need in raising our children are deeper 
than just giving orders and, and teaching um, obedience, as, as important as that is. The needs in our, or, or families or the need of raising a, a happy home, a happy family, it boils very much down to how well you can convey God's love and God's blessings to your life unto your children. <clears throat> when Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, he was thinking of us as parents as well. The better we live in this love relationship, the better parents we will become. In fact, we could say that all we as parents do is we pass this love on. Now, that's not necessarily boiling it into the practical, uh, smaller details. We might get to some of that, but... This is the main flow, parenting in faith, parenting in faith. Children grow up and children know, yep, my dad, my mom, they were in a deep love relationship with God, unquestionable so. Faith of our fathers living still. When I, when I think of that writer and that song, I'm, I'm often wondered, what did he have in mind? Faith of our fathers. I look at my dad. I look at me as, as one of the, of the uh, nine, well, eight children that are still alive of, of my parents. Some of us have started, some of us have readjusted our values and, uh, you know, outwardly speaking, values have changed. What about the faith that our father had or that our grandfather had? In my case, I would like to say we're still in that faith. Some of you might sit here and st say, by the grace of God, I've been able to change that. I am not in the faith of my father because my father was not in the right faith. Practices, cultural traditions are all important, but they are never as important as your faith. Sometimes we miss and we pass on the practices, but we miss to pass on the faith. I would like to leave that as a challenge with us as fathers. It's, it's important to pass and to teach practices. Are you okay with your faith? If your children will live in your faith? Do we have that still in, in the right order of priorities? 1 Corinthians 13. The first few verses uh, give us uh, a challenge. Verse three I'm gonna use and it says, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. In other words, if we use the rod of discipline without a relationship with our children, the results will be negative. Our children interpret our love as time time spent with them. Play with your children. And I just want to plead this. Today I'm speaking, uh, like I said, uh, not that I, I preached this message before we had children, but I can feel it in my heart. There's a little bit of a difference today than it was 25 years ago when I would have had a similar message. But to spend time with your children, play with your children. I look back today and I remember a time <clears throat> about 18 years ago that there was a fairly urgent church thing going on back right here and Pastor Norman Penner called me one evening and asked me to come for a meeting, uh, some kind of an important uh, restoration on, on certain, I forget what the, what the thing was and I had decided that night I'm going to stay home and I remember telling Mr. Penner, he was pastor and I said, you know what, I'm staying home today I'm, I'm playing with my children. And um, as I look back today, I, I say that with a sense of satisfaction. It's, it, it was just in a time when that all of a sudden got revealed in our home that this now needs to become priority. Now, please don't look at me as that, that we made it perfect. That, that's not, not at all the case, but this would be one of those incidents that I felt I was making a, a decision that was very much out of my normal practices. My normal practices would have been church always got first uh, priority. And um, 
I don't want to say that in a neglectful way or, or in a way that we can just ignore anything that is church related. Sometimes we are just simply too busy to, uh, to even have time for family and church because we have become too busy with too many other things. But to let the family know that there is a priority here and other things will now fall by the wayside usually comes back with a great blessing. <clears throat> play with your children. You that have young children, play with them on the floor and uh, be, be at their levels. I uh, realize I have to uh, go a little bit faster. There's a verse in uh, Ezekiel chapter 3. I think it's verse 13. I had that verse too, but, but Ezekiel was asked to go and spend seven days with Israel. And uh, so he went and he spent at this one place and he spent seven days without saying a word. Read it for yourself, Ezekiel chapter three. And after he had spent the, the seven days in silence, all of a sudden he saw what was going on. And I, I thought of myself, that is probably what I need to do. Just be at home. Just, just be there. Don't feel that, oh, it's a very great event. Now I'm home. It's, it's all important now. No, just be there. Live on the floor with your little ones. This is not just child play. We are laying foundation. We are laying foundation stones for a lifelong relationship. Your children might not remember that you played with them when they were two years old, but you do. And that is important as a, as a Christian father. <clears throat> Enjoy your children. That is a, that is a heart uh, that's something that I would like to share with all of your, my heart. Enjoy your children. Look at this as a time that will quickly come to an end and we are here to enjoy them. Enjoy the times as a family. Make it a valuable time. You know, and we've got to have some order. We've got to have some discipline in order that it is an enjoyable time. Undisciplined uh, family life ruins good times and so many families, therefore, today enjoy very little enjoyable time because there's a lack of discipline. Make, make it enjoyable for everyone in the, in the circle, whether you have smaller children to a grown-up children, it's, a, it's necessary that we all function in one circle and it's, a, it's an enjoyable time. <clears throat> enjoy your children and they will enjoy you too. As believing parents, important that we bless our children. A point that I would like to stress. You know, blessing children that are constantly in rebellion and knowing that they're disobedient will likely not work too good. Being parents in the faith means that you are in control. Means that you have enough control in your home that you can bless your children. It's very little meaning for us to, come, to have somebody come and bless us if we know that there's no connection, there's no relationship. That's considered flattery. You hear this in the nowadays friendly world, the supposedly friendly world that we live in, that somebody is going to come and he will try to make you feel very good, which is actually not a bad exercise. But really it doesn't mean much if you know that the person is not really connected to you. Or children... They want to have our heart's connection and out of there want to have our blessing. So as believing parents, bless your children. Bless them in the way you are. I, I, I like to emphasize that. Your words are good and they're necessary, but are you truly a blessing in their presence? Do children look forward to see mom and dad? Brings me back to the days when I grew up. <clears throat> And uh, I so yearn, like every other child, I so yearn to be blessed by my parents, especially from my dad. There was just this yearning. I think it's a natural thing. I think we had all the same thing. And uh, we were, were awaiting the blessing from our dad. Now, it wasn't that my dad would uh, very formally come and give his blessing. Uh, we don't do that. You know what? In, in family, to have things in a formal way is, doesn't really work very well. It's, it's okay to have a formal thing from time to time, but you're, at, at home you're informal. You're just who you are. And so 
It's not that I expected dad to come and stand in front of me and that will give me words of blessing, but his presence would bless me. But his, there were times where his presence did very much the opposite. And uh, I, I grew up that way and maybe that was just an inner hearts thing. Maybe that doesn't speak to all of us, but I would very much uh, be alert. How will my dad come out of, uh, you know, come, come out in the morning uh, to the work you know, in my life, it was choring the cows. How will he come in? Will he be a man of blessings or will he have gotten out of the wrong side of bed, they call it sometimes. And you know, sometimes that was too often the case. Every time I sense that today we're not in for a blessed day, that's when my heart would close. There was nothing to share as far as any deeper struggles. But when I felt that there was an openness, there was an appreciation there was a blessing. It stirred me to say stuff out of my personal life that was necessary for me and him to share. So that is how we go get out of the bad. Let me just say this to all of us as fathers. And um, I wish I could say this in the right way. Children, when they wake up in the morning, especially younger children, it is somewhat the expected thing that you, you, you kind of, uh, you just don't know. Maybe our, our young child will wake up grumpy and he's just going to cry. And we don't know exactly why. He's just not happy. Uh, well, we try to figure it out. What about dad? How, how clear is that when dad or when mom wakes up in the morning? How clear is that that, that dad is not going to be grumpy and quiet and short-natured and, and all these things? I like to keep things simple today in the message, and that is this, fathers and even mothers, but more emphasis on the father, you have never a right to come in front of your family being disgruntled or unhappy or critical. Never. We are there to bless. We are the Jesus Christ in the family. Jesus Christ never grumps or is negative or critical at us. As fathers, as soon as we come up with that <clears throat> mindset, we close the children's mind, just like Jesus would to us. If we come to Jesus and my impression is he's unhappy, he's negative, he's whatever, uh, critical, I'm not gonna go back to him. But I feel he's open. We might not feel the happiness in us, but we should never pour that out to our family. We are receptive, and to be receptive, you are open, and you are a man who has fought the fight and has won the battles before you come in front of your family. <clears throat> That's a blessing. And lastly, the training. Let's train our children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. That is something that we pass on. We, we teach our children to love God. We, we make it known or we train them. We, we, uh, we, uh, we create the habit as we are a God-loving family. We, we like the things that we see about God. We therefore do things like God would like them done. And it is nurturing them in the Lord or admonition of the Lord. <clears throat> you can teach. And here's some, just some practical encouragement. Now, we day by day, we slowly teach and train our children onto the narrow path. They will one day have to make up their own mind whether they want to believe in Christ as their savior. That's something you and I as parents will never do. But we can, we can train them towards there. We move towards the goal. The goal is a disciple of Jesus Christ dedicated to God. Let's not expect our children to be more dedicated to God than what we are. So the practice, again, starts with us. But here's a few hints. You can teach your children to, let's just say as an example, sit still and listen during your family time or your family devotion around your table. This is something that we can do. This is a good way to, to start. This is here where you teach your children to, to uh, cooperate with you in church. But if they don't need to do that at home, likely they won't do it in church or in the public. <clears throat> we can teach our children to enjoy the food 
that mom has, has uh, cooked. We can teach our children to clean up their toys after them. And on and on, the, the little practical things go. All of this adds to order. All of this adds to a pleasant home. We can teach our children good manners by routinely going over what is expected. Now here's the other one. You can teach your children to wake up cheerfully and get up promptly when called in the morning. This is part of being trained. <clears throat> you can teach your children to lay down their heads and take a nap without any fuss. It's a process. Let's make that as an aim. We can train them to do simple chores and, and teach them responsibility in a young life. You can root out complaining and whining attitudes that children often express. It's part of being a child. This is part of how they respond when they, when they have to do something they don't like. And you and I as parents, we train them not to allow this mindset to rule in their hearts. We can teach or live by an example how to win souls. Take them with you. Let them listen as you witness to others. One of those things that I really appreciate of my dad, back in the days, my Spanish was very, very limited. But in many conversations that my dad had among the Spanish people, including German people, but I, I got enough that here's, there's, there's a sharing of the gospel going on. Whether they agreed or not, I didn't get that. But there was something going on, and I would listen in. You know, on and on the list goes. We will have to, to cut it short. We can teach our children. We can memorize scriptures with them. That's a good exercise that I just want to uh, encourage us. Uh, I think Rosie here was mentioning that she had memorized Psalm 103, and I was thinking, huh, I knew this point was in my message, and I was thinking, that would be a good example. As a family, let's just recite Psalm 103 and you do that as a part of a family devotion you say let's start this uh, I'm not, not here to, to uh, change your plans but to have a plan in mind we're doing something it's in family devotion so, so often we just have family devotion which is a good thing to have but children don't necessarily grow up with the idea or with the feeling that we're doing something important it's just you know we do this some comes morning, breakfast, or whatever it is. We're just having family devotion, which is a good, and I want to encourage that. But let's have our family devotion of such that we are actually doing something. And if that means that we're now memorizing something, we're, we're having a family project going, we're all in this together, it's, it brings so much life when children all of a sudden feel, hey, we're doing something, we're, we're, we have to do something. Can I pray with you? Let's pray. Lord, you are the good and the great God. I thank you so very much how you have given us the means of being parents, how you have given us the gift to parent and to raise the families that we have. God, I pray today, especially for us as fathers, help us to accept and to embrace the, the, the opportunity as fathering to embrace that with something that we do with you together and help us to do that in faith. Help us to believe that you have given us the gift to do that. God, I pray that you would encourage us. I pray for the mothers that are in the work of parenting, that there too you would give them the grace to parent. As a vessel that passes on the love of Christ that you have given to us at first and now we're passing on to the children. I pray your, your protection over all of our homes and as Satan is there trying to steal, to kill, and to destroy, God, I pray that your hedge of protection would be around every home and that ultimately we would all rely on that protection. In Jesus' name.